Hello again, everybody. We are going to focus here on angina. So angina is basically, uh, to put it in a broad term, is chest pain with exertion. You're going to want to differentiate what kind of angina it is because that's going to dictate how we treat the patient. So stable angina is chest pain with exertion, but it's relieved with rest. Unstable angina is chest pain with exertion that's not relieved with rest, or it's chest pain that's new or worse than previous episodes. But mostly focus on chest pain with exertion that is not relieved with rest. Um, this is the only little point here I'm going to give attention to Prince Metal's angina because it's pretty uncommon, but you may see it on the exam. So we'll just take our focus away from stable and unstable angina for a second. Prince Metal angina is angina that occurs with cycles. It occurs during the day when you're having lunch. It occurs when you're uh, at the gym. It occurs when you're at home watching TV. It occurs when you're sleeping. So there's no rhyme or rhythm to this kind of angina. It just occurs uh, in cycles and whenever it wants to. And so when you have a patient with a history of just these random uh, bouts of chest pain uh, that fits an angina picture, um, then you're going to want to think uh, Prince Metal's angina, particularly in a patient who has a history of migraines. Uh, why? It's because both of these are due to vasospasm. So you can diagnose this one of two ways. One, you can diagnose it on angiogram, and what you'll see is a spasm of the coronary arteries. Uh, or you can diagnose it with an ergonavine challenge and basically just give the patient ergonavine, uh, and that will exacerbate the pain. Uh, and you just treat Prince Metal's angina with CCBs. So I wouldn't spend too much time worrying about this, just know the basics. Okay, so back to uh, angina. So the pain for angina is substernal. It's always substernal. It's described as crushing or heavy, like an elephant is sitting on my chest. Uh, and it lasts minutes to hours. This is not the pain that's days to weeks. So if the patient comes in and they said, I've been having this chest pain for five days, not angina. Uh, sometimes there will be a radiation to the upper arm or shoulder, uh, but that's not necessary to make a diagnosis of angina. If the pain radiates to the back between the scapulae, then you should be thinking uh, of possibly uh, an aortic dissection. So angina is always associated, uh, as far as we're concerned, it's always associated with coronary artery disease. Okay, so nomenclature here can be kind of difficult to keep track of. So I made this little diagram for you. So angina is a very broad uh, descriptor. It's broken up into stable angina, which is angina that goes away with rest, and unstable angina, which is angina that does not go away with rest. And remember, angina is just substernal chest pain. Uh, unstable angina is uh, also known as the acute coronary syndromes. And these acute coronary syndromes, so unstable angina is going to be one of these three things. So it's either going to be non-MI, so just unstable angina. It'll be NSTEMI, so that's an actual MI. It's a, a, a blockage where we're actually depriving the, uh, the heart tissue of oxygen to the point where we're getting positive cardiac enzymes or STEMI, uh, which is a total occlusion where we're getting necrosis. And so these three are the acute coronary syndromes, and we'll talk about how to differentiate these uh, coming up here. All of these, though, are due to coronary artery disease. So the pathophysiology of angina is simply pain because we have oxygen demand that outweighs uh, the oxygen supply. So think about it as if you're lifting weights, why would you stop lifting the 100 pound dumbbell when you're, when you're working out? It's because your muscles are starting to be painful. That's the exact same thing with angina. What you have is you have heart muscle that has to work and uh, because you've got to maintain your, your blood pressure and your circulation, but the oxygen supply just is not enough. And so your heart is in pain. That doesn't mean that the heart can't continue pumping. You can have stable or unstable angina, but uh, you're gonna have pain because you're just not getting enough oxygen, as much oxygen as you should be getting. 
This is due to vaso occlusion, and the vaso occlusion is generally due to atherosclerotic plaques. So what does that come from? That comes from having a high cholesterol. So you don't have to worry about histology for USMLE steps two or three, um, but remember what the cholesterol plaque looks like, and here we have the normal lumen of the artery, and here's the new lumen here. This is our narrower lumen, and this is the plaque right here. This cholesterol plaque, and if you looked deep enough into this, if you uh, zoomed in enough, you would see cholesterol crystals. This is a uh, macroscopic view, and you can he see here this fatty yellow cholesterol plaque. And this is the lumen here that would co correspond to this part here. So this plaque here is right here, and this lumen here is right here. All right, so another way to look at it uh, here is Here's your normal coronary artery, here's atherosclerosis, and you get end STEMI, or STEMI most of the time, uh, when you get a blood clot that travels and blocks off the artery. Okay, so angina, uh, like I said, is due to coronary artery disease, and there are specific risk factors that are associated with angina. Most of them are modifiable, some of them aren't. So what can't we change? Well, age, we can't change our age. Age is associated with increased incidence of angina. So over the age of 60. Can't change our gender, uh, at least we can't change our chromosomes. So male gender is associated with angina. And then of course our family history. Okay, so what can we change? Cholesterol levels, uh, we can control. Uh, particularly the LDL is the most important of the cholesterol levels. We want to have a target LDL of less than 100 in, uh, in the majority of patients, but if the patient uh, uh, has diabetes, then we're going to want to have it actually below 70. Uh, smoking is associated with coronary artery disease, so uh, we want uh, all patients to stop smoking, no matter what, but particularly to get rid of the coronary artery disease or to reduce the risk. Hypertension is associated with coronary artery disease, so we want to manage that. Obesity is associated with coronary artery disease and sedentary lifestyle. And all of these are individually associated with coronary artery disease, so these are all individual players, even though uh, you're going to see a lot of these. Uh, in, uh, you're going to see in, in most patients, you'll see at least two of these at the same time. It's going to be very rare to see any of these isolated in one patient, uh, except for maybe smoking. Okay, so here's a vignette. So we have a 62-year-old man with a history of hypercholesterolemia, and he presents to the clinic com complaining of episodes of substernal pain that he describes as crushing. He says that these episodes are brought on by going up the stairs or by chasing after his dog, but they're relieved promptly by rest. What is the most likely diagnosis in this patient? And you should know here that since this is relieved by rest, this is stable angina. Okay, so uh, managing the patient with stable angina. So now we have our patient, we know that they have stable angina, we've diagnosed them. So how are we going to, to take care of this person? First of all, we want to take into consideration uh, what the patient's modifiable risk factors are. So remember what we said those are, those are cholesterol, smoking, hypertension, lifestyle, and weight. So first off, uh, we want to make sure that we draw a cholesterol panel on this patient, and if they have an LDL of greater than 100, uh, then we want to start the patient on a statin. If they if it's greater than 70 and they have diab if, if if they have diabetes and it's greater than 70, then we want to start them on a statin as well. So we have different cutoff there. So controlling the LDL with a statin uh, is is most important. Next, of course, we want them to stop smoking. Uh, and then, of course, we also want to control their hypertension with an ACE inhibitor or a diuretic. Uh, lifestyle modifications are going to be important as well, uh, including uh, weight loss. So your workup should always include an exercise stress test, which we'll talk about in a, in a bit. Uh, we also want to get a cholesterol panel to see where that LDL is and to see if we need to start treating it with a statin. Uh, we're also going to want to get a diabetes workup on this patient uh, if they have uh, signs that are pointing towards 
possible uh, diabetes. So we'll want to have a fasting glucose level on them and then if appropriate an A1C and a CMP. Uh, the LDL cutoff, and this is what I want to uh, focus on most here, I want to stress this most, uh, is what the LDL cutoff is. So when we have a patient with stable angina, we want to check their cholesterol. If their cholesterol is greater than 100, always, always, always statin. If, it's, if they have diabetes and, uh, and they have stable angina, so stable angina plus diabetes, then the LDL cutoff is going to be lower. So uh, then in that case, if it's anything greater than 70, then we're going to start them on a statin. And remember, uh, our statins are atorvastatin, pravastatin, simvastatin, and so forth. And remember what they do, they're HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, and that is the rate-limiting enzyme in uh, our own biosynthesis of cholesterol. And so it lowers cholesterol that way. Remember what the uh, major side effects of statins are. Uh, number one, uh, the most common you're going to see is muscle pain. Uh, if the patient can bear it, then that's you can continue the statin. Uh, the more significant side effect is going to be rhabdomyolysis. So any patient coming in who's on a statin, who has muscle pain, you're going to want to think of rhabdomyolysis. So remember that association here. It doesn't really have anything to do with angina, but uh, uh, statins do. So. Uh, of course, the lifestyle modifications are always advisable. Uh, and then medications. So this patient who has stable angina, what are we going to be give, giving them all the time? Aspirin. Aspirin is very, very important in any patient who uh, has stable angina. They are at significant risk for MI, so we want to make sure that they're on uh, aspirin. We want to start them on a beta blocker. So propranolol would be a good choice. And then, of course, the statin if their LDL is, is high. So always any patient with stable angina, they're going to be put on aspirin, daily aspirin, uh, and beta blocker. And then uh, statin if the LDL is high. Okay, so we talked about stress testing. Uh, let's talk about this in some greater detail. So any patient with stable angina is going to be uh, getting stress tested. So stress testing is a screen to see if the patient needs a more invasive management for their coronary artery disease. Remember what we said, that angina is basically equal to coronary artery disease. It is basically pathognomonic. So, uh, so we use stress testing as a screen to see how can we treat this coronary artery disease uh, invasively if we need to. And so there's two different modalities that we use. Uh, the most common is the exercise stress test, and that's what this guy is doing right here. And basically what this is, is we hook this patient up to an EKG, and we calculate what their maximum heart rate is, and that's just 220 minus your age. So if you're a 55-year-old patient, then uh, the maximum heart rate is going to be 165, and then we take 80% of that. Uh, and, and so we, want, we get the patient, we make them exercise on the treadmill up to 80% of their maximum heart rate, and then we look at the EKG. And uh, this doctor presumably is looking at the EKG, not the patient, she shouldn't be, she should be looking at the EKG, because once you see a, uh, an ST depression of uh, more than two millimeters, then that is going to be a positive stress test. So if they go the whole way, if they go up to whatever 80% of their maximum heart rate is, so let's say 140, and they go all the way there and they don't develop any ischemia, uh, they don't have that ST depression at all, they don't have any hypotension, they don't have a drop in their systolic blood pressure of more than 10 millimeters of mercury, none of that happens, then they have a negative stress test and it ends there. Don't have to do anything more. Uh, but if any time on that way to 80% of their maximum heart rate, uh, if they develop uh, two millimeters or more of ST depression on any lead, or they develop hypotension, so a drop in systolic blood pressure of 10 millimeters of mercury or more, um, because we would expect that their blood pressure should go up when they're exercising, then we diagnose this as a positive stress test. Now let's say that the patient is morbidly obese or they're bedridden, then we have a patient that cannot do an exercise stress test. So uh, in that case, we're gonna do a chemical stress test. So we don't use the treadmill. 
So a chemical stress test is used if, uh, if exercise is not possible or if the patient has pre-existing EKG anomalies. Because remember how we do the exercise stress test. We have a patient walking, so we need to have a patient who is mobile and able to exercise, able to get their heart rate up. And then we also need to be able to look at the EKG and see changes on there. So uh, if they have pre-existing EKG anomalies, like a dysrhythmia or a pacemaker, uh, then in that case we're not going to be able to see the EKG anomalies that we're going to need to see to diagnose a positive stress test. So uh, anytime the patient has pre-existing EKG anomalies, we're going to need to get a chemical stress test instead of an exercise stress test. And of course, anytime the patient can't exercise, if it's not logistically possible, then we're going to get a chemical stress test. So there's two different kinds of chemical stress tests. There's the dobutamine echo stress test, which is more commonly used. And uh, all this is, is it's the administration of dobutamine, which is a positive inotrope, uh, and that increases the heart rate. And what happens then is uh, uh, we look at the heart with a, an echocardiogram, and if we see decreased cardiac wall movement, uh, then uh, you would have what's considered a positive uh, echo stress test. Don't worry about knowing what this looks like. Don't worry about how this works. Just know that if you have a patient that can't exercise or has pre-existing anomalies and they get an echo stress test, that decreased cardiac wall movement is a positive stress test for that patient. The other chemical stress test that we can use is the dipyridamol th uh, thallium stress test. This is also known as thallium scintigraphy. And uh, what this is is a, a nuclear imaging test. And what you do is administer thallium, radioactive uh, thallium, to the patient. And thallium is uh, taken up by the cardiac myocytes the same way it takes up potassium. So if we have cells that are not working properly, then they will not take up thallium as they should. And so we will see areas of decreased uptake. Uh, and that would be a positive chemical stress test in this case. Okay, so we've got a patient. We gave them a stress test. It's positive. What do we do now? Now we give the patient an angiogram. So all patients with positive, with positive stress tests are going to require an angiogram to determine the extent and the severity of the atherosclerosis that they have. We don't know uh, how bad the atherosclerosis is, we just know it's bad enough to cause uh, either the decreased wall movement, the decreased thallium uptake, or in the exercise stress test, the ST depression or hypotension. So we get an angiogram. Uh, on the angiogram, if the patient has three vessel disease or left main artery disease, then the patient is going to need coronary artery bypass graft. So that's going to be a surgery. That's the, the uh, commonly uh, known as uh, bypass surgery. So cabbage, C-A-B-G. Other patients, uh, that just have a single vessel disease, they can get angioplasty with stenting. So basically we can just go in, probably even in the same uh, angiogram, we can just go in and put the stent in, uh, in the, the diseased artery. So if it's three vessel disease or left main artery disease, then they have to go in for surgery. Uh, if uh, it's a patient with other patients, I put, if it's generally you have to know where the disease is, but if it's just a one vessel disease, then uh, it's going to be angioplasty with stenting. Okay, so let's recap. So we have a patient with stable angina. Uh, so all patients with stable angina, they're going to be uh, put on aspirin and beta blockers and a statin if needed based on where their LDL is at. If it's greater, th greater than 100, uh, or then they'll always need a statin. If it's greater than 70, if they have diabetes, then they'll uh, always need a statin. Uh, stress test, uh, after we diagnose the stable angina, if it's negative, we don't need to do anything more. If it's positive, then we get the angiogram. And uh, three vessel or left main artery disease, uh, they're gonna go in for surgery. 
for bypass surgery, and then other disease, they're going to get just simple angioplasty with stenting. All right, now let's kind of change our vignette here. So this is the same patient. 62-year-old man with history of hypercholesterolemia, now he presents to the ED instead. And he's complaining not just of episodes of chest pain, now he's complaining of substernal pain that he describes as crushing. He says that the, th that the episodes are brought on by going up the stairs or chasing after his dog, and this episode has continued despite rest. What is the most likely diagnosis in this patient? And it's going to be unstable angina which could be just simply unstable angina, or it could be myocardial infarction, so NSTEMI or STEMI. What is the best next step in the management of this patient? And you better know this for the USMLE and for real life because you will save lives by doing this. And it's going to be the EKG. So you are going to immediately get an EKG on this patient who has risk factors for uh, MI and is presenting with classic unstable angina. Immediately get your EKG and that's going to help you diagnose STEMI if that's the, uh, the problem. Uh, so you'll see the ST elevation. Um, if it's not uh, STEMI, then you won't see any changes on the EKG or you may see mild ST depression. Uh, you also want to get your cardiac enzymes on this patient while you're waiting, uh, you're be doing your EKG, but you want to have cardiac enzymes on this patient. Uh, that's going to be your CKMB and your troponins. Meanwhile, you're also going to be giving this patient aspirin or clopidogrel, uh, a beta blocker, either IV or PO. You're going to give this patient a nitrate for their chest pain, and you're going to start the patient on heparin. And this is an acute coronary syndrome. So what I want you to know is that your first step in a patient that you have diagnosed with unstable angina is going to be an EKG. Are we going to get cardiac enzymes? Yes. Is that the next best step? No. EKG is the next best step because it is the necessary step. Because if this patient is having a heart attack, having a, a STEMI heart attack, which is the most deadly heart attack, then the EKG is going to tell us. And, and with STEMI, EKG will tell us. We don't need the cardiac enzymes with STEMI. EKG will tell us. So that's why we get the EKG. That is the next best step in a patient with unstable angina. We're going to also be getting the cardiac enzymes and the medical management is going to be aspirin, beta blocker, nitrate, heparin, uh, and I didn't put that on here, but uh, we can also give them morphine for the pain. Uh, those are all going to be fine and good, but EKG is the next step. And this is an acute coronary syndrome, and we'll talk about that in the next set of slides. So I will see you there.